good evening. My name is Grace Hayek, and on behalf of the Glencoe Public Library, I welcome you to our program with Rachel Wexer. And now I will introduce Rachel. She is a professor of creative writing at Northwestern University and the author of four books of poetry and cross-genre writing. She's taught writing workshops through the National Urban League, Chicago Public Schools, Gallery 37, and the Pacific Northwest College of Art, working to bring diversity and anti-racist awareness into creative writing curricula. Rachel's essays, poems, and stories have been published in outlets including Poetry, Tin House, and the Yale Review. Benjamin Banneker and Us is her first nonfiction book. She lives in Evanston yeah, <laughs> with her husband and daughter. After Rachel's presentation, she'll be glad to field your questions. Rachel, you are very welcome here tonight, and I'll let you take it from here. So. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks to Grace and to Elizabeth from the bookstall and to Michelle <laughs> Rue Blitchman who helped make this connection. And um, I also want to say thank you to your mom, <laughs> who Judy Krug, I know some of you may know her, but she was the head of the American Library Association and uh, Freedom to Read foundation and was a huge force in working against the banning of books. And so I think that she comes up in my mind a lot with a lot of gratitude. And I have a lot of gratitude to librarians and libraries for the space you hold for democracy, for these kinds of conversations, for freedom and access to information, especially right now when the kinds of subjects that I'll be talking about tonight are really under threat. So thank you all for being here and thank you for doing what you do here at this beautiful library. Um, it's such a beautiful space. So um, Benjamin Banneker and us, this is my first book of creative nonfiction, nonfiction. And um, I had written a lot, I'd written a lot of poetry and then I'd been writing a lot of essays and I was writing a lot about uh, my upbringing in Ohio and about the state of this country. And it was 2016 when I was at a family reunion and I was discussing some of the ideas, ideas of representation, who gets to tell what story, things like that with my cousin who said, well, it's especially interesting if you think about how much mixed race ancestry there is in this country and um, including in our family. And I said, oh, really? And um, then proceeded to tell me that another cousin of ours, a first cousin, had done genealogy work with ancestry and then some pretty rigorous documentary research and had found out that we had many generations of African-American ancestry um, that had been hidden when our family had passed as white in the late 1800s. And that um, this line of ancestry went back to the sister of Benjamin Banneker, who was a revolutionary era um, scientist. So he was an astronomer. He helped to survey Washington, D.C. He invented, uh, he invented and created created a clock in his early 20s, which in that part of the Chesapeake was one of the only clocks in the region. So he was just known as an intellectual then. I had never heard of him. I had never been taught about him in school. So I had quite a powerful reaction to that moment. First, why do I not know about this figure who sounds so important in American history? And why did we not know about this family that's part of our family? So I thought, isn't this curious and telling at this moment? And you remember that season, that election season of 2016. It was, it was very, it was the beginning of an intensity we're still in, to tell you the truth. And we were all riding a roller coaster. But I felt that the narrative of what this country means was really cracking open and revealing that people had completely different ideas ideas of what this nation meant. And so it felt very powerful to me that I was introduced to this story right at that moment. And so, of course, I immediately started studying and researching. And this is a quote by Toni Morrison, one of my great guides as a reader and a professor. Exactly. <laughs> Let's all clap for Toni Morrison, um, but became sort of a guiding quote for me, contrary to what you may have heard or learned the past is not done and it is not over. 
It's still in process, which is another way of saying that when it's critiqued and analyzed, it yields new information about itself. The past is already changing as it is being re-examined, as it is being listened to for deeper resonances. Actually, it can be more liberating than any imagined future if you are willing to identify its evasions, its distortions, its lies, and are willing to unleash its secrets. So that's definitely what she brought to her own fiction is going back into the past for the stories that needed to be told and voicing those stories. And I kept this quote with me as this idea that the past has energy and it needs to be retold. So I immediately started researching this book. Um, any writer coming upon these stories would be very excited. It wasn't only Benjamin Banneker that I learned about, but people in the family who had done all of these courageous things, including his grandmother who came from England and was an indentured servant and was said to have been put on trial for stealing a bucket of milk. And which is actually not uncommon. There were so many working class and poor teenagers in England at this time. And this is around 1680, that they were just doing anything they could to get rid of, of these teenagers. And so she was sentenced to hang and yet she pled the book, which meant that she showed that she could read, she could read the Bible. And because she could read the Bible and prove that she was a literate person, she was sentenced to a lesser sentence of indentured servitude in the new, the new world, in the Chesapeake. So this idea of reading to save our own lives becomes one of the threads of the book. And it was one of the things I was, I was initially really interested in was Molly's story. Um, so I started doing some kind of fervent research and reading, and then that next summer I decided to take my daughter and my niece on a research trip disguised as a vacation. <laughs> this is what we do as writers. We say, oh, it'll be fun. And we're doing research too. But I actually really, uh, in all seriousness, they were fifth graders, which meant that the Common Core was when they were learning American history. And so I wanted to teach them an American history that was different than the history I had been taught. And that luckily, uh, to all the educators out there, they are learning a different history than I was taught but I realized that I was taught a pretty white male military history and I wanted to give them a different kind of story so we did the the great migration in reverse and we drove down through Ohio so we went to this area where our ancestors had come and settled in Ohio when it was the new northwest territory and people of color were allowed to buy land in the early 1800s. And so we visited that area first, and then we drove the route they would have come in wagons and went down to Maryland where the Banneker family lived. And so amazingly, Benjamin Banneker was the child of free people of color and they owned a hundred acres of land in the revolutionary era in 1836 his parents bought this land and it is now a nature preserve and a park in maryland so this is us visiting this park in maryland this is a reproduction of his cabin and this is sort of the quest part of the story so i We'll read. I'm going to read two little excerpts from the book. Um, the book proceeds in a present day quest for the story. And then every other chapter, if you've read it, you've seen this, is a historical chapter about the ancestors. So this is um, toward the beginning. It's called Reverse Migration. And it's uh, me taking my kids on this trip. Reverse Migration. The summer after learning about Molly and the Banneker family, I took my daughter Adele and niece Gwyneth on a road trip to explore this history. They were fifth graders at the time, which is when the Common Core curriculum in public schools covers colonial and revolutionary US history. I wanted to teach them histories that were different from the white male military accounts I had been taught in school. So I did the great migration in reverse, beginning in Ohio, the state that had once represented the free North to our ancestors. Benjamin Banneker's nephew and our ancestor, Aquilalette, 
moved his family to Ohio in the 1820s after they and other free people of color were stripped of their voting rights and their farms in Maryland. The Lett brothers traveled with a few other free families of color into what was then known as the New Northwest Territory. They worked on others' land at first and eventually joined together to purchase more than 1,000 acres in Muskingum County, Ohio. They named the cooperative the Lett Settlement and together established a self-sustaining community. They built their own homes and a church, baked their own bricks, cut their own lumber and shingles, grew their own food, and did their own blacksmithing and sewing. I drove us back and forth through the county looking for the historical marker that I'd seen online, hoping to see the old church or schoolhouse, but we couldn't find any trace of the Lett Settlement. We stopped at two gas stations and a subway where we bought chips and made conversation with the locals who were all white farmers and working men. No one had ever heard of the Lett Settlement. Then I used data on my phone and headed toward the little pin where Google had located the historical marker. We drove down a long gravel road beside undulating fields with thick woods off in the distance. We could see a green metal gate up ahead that I hoped was a turnoff into a farm with a sign, but it turned out to be an African safari park called the Wilds. The girls and I got out of the car hot and thirsty. A female ranger walked up and explained that the place had been established as a wildlife conservatory and nature theme park in 1984. She told me that I could pay $25 each for the kids to go zip lining through the woods or $100 to ride in a Jeep and see the wildlife. We would see American bison and a number of African animals roaming free, including wild dogs, zebras, giraffes, and rhinos. It's a lot like being on an African safari, she assured me cheerily. I felt a sudden nausea. Our, I, it was so disorienting. I was so weird. Our ancestors had been kidnapped from Africa, had found a way to survive in America and eventually buy this land in the early 19th century. But they were forced off the land later during the Fugitive Slave Act. And then again in the 20th century, when lawyers purporting to represent the Southern Ohio Coal Company began strip mining the fields. Then, in the beginning of the 21st century, the mine was closed and the land was converted into an African safari park. It seemed we had stumbled into a particularly American example of historical erasure a half-told story that moved from resilience to exploitation to the domestication of wildness and that all ended in a gift shop. The gift shop was filled with stuffed African animals and it made me think of the souvenirs of Disney World, a place I had loved as a child. I had absorbed a Disney-like version of American history too, I realized, filled with tales of orphans, explorers, and upward mobility. I thought about our penchant for happy endings in America, about how desperately our optimistic our stories have been in order to hide the denials behind them. Americans have had an insistence on our historical innocence that sometimes manifests in an absurd prolonging of childhood. If we are only children, the logic goes, of course we must be innocent. I asked the rangers if they knew about a commemorative marker for the Lett settlement. They said it was around somewhere in a storage set, shed, but apparently a worker kept accidentally running it over with his truck. My daughter begged to stay and go zip lining, but I was a single mother on a tight budget and the place just costs too much. It was 90 degrees outside and only getting hotter. I bought the girls ice cream sandwiches at the snack bar and asked them to stand with me on the hill and imagine what our ancestors would have seen when they looked out at that land 200 years ago. They had to clear these fields by hand, I said. This place would have represented hope to them, this land over the Ohio River, finally in the free north. The girls nodded tiredly and I wondered how much they understood how much any of us understood. We took a photo with the fields and woods in the background and got back into the car. So that's sort of um, a moment from the beginning of this quest. 
I continued to do research, and I, but I did not know how to really enter this project ethically. As a person who had grown up as a white person, not knowing the history, I felt that there were many, many ways to go, go about this project incorrectly or unethically because it represented a towering black figure in American history and African American history. So I continued to do research. I wrote one little op-ed style essay. It was like a thousand words, very short. And it was called White Lies in History. And it talked about the resilience of the ancestors who'd moved to Ohio and how the fact that my family's losing track of that story and those ancestors was mirrored in a wider cultural denial. And I named the ancestors. So two years passed. I kept researching writing, thinking maybe I'd write a long essay about this. I had written a long essay. And um, after two years, my cousin, Edie Lee Harris, who's here on this side, on the, the left here, um, she, the right to you, she saw this essay I had written and found me and got in contact and said, we need to talk about our family. And so this was right before COVID. It was 2019. Um, I guess it was November of 2019. Um, and we got on the phone and it was like we already knew each other. So she is a lawyer. She'd done 40 years of research into the Banneker family. And then our other cousin, Gwen Marable, is 90. And she had, had been instrumental in creating the Park and Museum. So she had done 40 years of advocacy for the family story. So basically the cousins brought me into the fold and were kind of like, oh good, you're here, you're a writer. We've been wondering when somebody would show up to help us work with this research. And as soon as I started talking to Edie and Gwen and Robert, who becomes really important to the book, I understood that this was the way I wanted to write it, that this is the way that felt ethical, not only because they could talk about their experience as Black people growing up in their own generations, um, but because it broke the mold of the individual story. So I didn't just want to tell another great man narrative. I didn't want to tell another story that puts someone in isolation. I wanted to tell a story of a context that is a family. And so I wanted it to be more of a chorus. So after that, every other chapter proceeds with Gwen or Edie or Robert or our cousin Edwin. And this is just, this is us on the Banneker land a couple years ago. Um, and this is Gwen, a little introduction to her. We have been muted. Oops. And now it's time to do as much as we can to let everybody know that there was this man, Benjamin Banneker, who lived a hundred years before Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. He was an African American man who was a scientist before his time. He would have been called a scientist, even though he never went to study science anywhere. There is a significance in the fact that we have come together at this time so that we can share this. And that is, I think, what's so important about today and being with both of you. So take it. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of the collaborative aspect of the book. Uh, there we are. These are the main uh, people in the book. Um, Edie, Gwen, our cousin Robert Lett, who is another family historian, and then Edwin Lee, um, some of you were at that reading at bookends where my cousin Edwin joined me and they joined me at many readings all through the spring and we met with many other descendants because the thing is any story that is about ancestry and genealogy cannot really be an individual story. Edie has connected 25,000 of us <laughs> to one of Benjamin Banneker's sisters. 
So this is not an individual acquisitional claiming. We are we honor our ancestors. We're amazed by them, but we're not. It's not an individualistic thing. It is part of a collective celebration. And so I really wanted to come up with a forum that also captured that. And so every other chapter is a conversation with one of my cousins. Okay. Um, I think we'll do questions at the end. It's a long time to just talk at you. But um, so the actual story that I ended up telling goes all the way back to Molly, who I mentioned, who was this dairy maid in England. She was um, sentenced to indentured servitude and she arrived in Maryland in 1683. Um, now we do not have a copy of her indenture, but we know that she was working on a uh, someone's farm named John Newman, who would have been bringing in hundreds of these teenagers from um, Europe and maybe bringing people up from the West Indies as well. So she was farming tobacco at, in indentured servitude. And then she, the oral history that was recorded is that she married Banaka, who was a Wolof man from Senegal. He was said to be a Wolof prince who had been kidnapped from Senegal. And so he was indentured or enslaved with her at the time. And this is a story that has been told through the generations of the family. And it was recorded when people started recording Benjamin's biography. Um, we did find some new things about the family. We had always hoped that somehow Molly and Banaka had been able to live with a certain degree of independence. Um, exactly, right? Someone just said, yeah, right. <laughs> there was a hope because they ended up having an unusual degree of freedom as a family. Um, but while I was working, working on the book, a document surfaced in the uh, Maryland archives. Another researcher found it and let Robert let know who let me know. Um, and this is how this sort of crowdsource resource research became very important. And that document is on the left. It's hard to read, but it is Mary Banneker, Benjamin's mother, arguing in court for the freedom of her children. And we learn from that document that her mother was an indentured servant and that Mary was put in indenture just for being a mixed race person, which is what the law said then. Just because she had an African father and a um, British mother, she would have been indentured. And this was at the very beginning of racial construction in this country. The first time whiteness was written into law, it was to forbid white women to marry Native American or African American men. At this time, they were all the working class together. So that was happening quite frequently to the point where uh, the Gooch, the um, governor of Virginia, William Gooch, had a whole slur about convict women who would marry these African men or marry these Native American men. So they started legislating female reproduction and creating a category of whiteness that put into place the horrific thing that would happen with enslavement. It set it up so that women's reproduction could be um, legally prevented and that they would eventually make the um, condition of the child follow that of the mother. So enslavement could be seen as a natural uh, process. So this, I go into all of that in the book, but it was extraordinary to find this document because in it, Benjamin Banneker's mother in 1731, she would have been pregnant with Benjamin then, argued before the provincial court for the freedom of her daughter, Sarah. Sarah was turning 16. She would have known intimately that if Sarah stayed in indenture at that age, she would probably be impregnated and it would continue the cycle of indenture or enslavement because it, you were punished if you became pregnant. So we see this courageous, we've already seen uh, two generations of courageous people now who set the stage for Benjamin Banneker. And she calls the indenture laws for children repugnant. And um, so we see that his, his mother, Mary, was also a very strong woman. 
like his grandmother, Molly. Um, so these are just some shots of our research. This was my editor, Shannon Chris for Henry Holt. She, this is the first book she ever acquired. And so she was also part of this lineage actually of black genius and of uh, reviving this story for the public. And she joined me on a research trip. And this is us looking at Benjamin Banneker's manuscript journal. It's all in the public domain. It's at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. And this is the journal where he would record his mathematics to create an almanac. So all of the equinoxes, the eclipses, the solstice, he did the math for that and he did the drawings for it. The journal is also filled with poems, math story problems and observations from nature. He observed the 17 year cycle of the cicadas and the fact that the star of Sirius is two bodies rotating one another. And he wrote that down in his journal 40 to 60 years before a European scientist would get public credit for it. So it's it's an extraordinary document. He wrote he wrote down his dreams, mystical poems, all kinds of things, sort of in a commonplace book. Unfortunately, we only have one of his journals because his um his cabin was burnt down on the day of his funeral, which often happened with prominent black people. He was prominent in his community. The family owned a hundred acres of land. He was literate. People would go to him to write things. And so you had people in the community angry about his prominence. And on the day of his funeral, they burn it down, his cabin. And so the only thing that survives is this one manuscript journal. Um, that his nephew had come and gotten. It was the one he was working on. So there's also a lot of grief when you do this kind of research into families of color. This has been called the most documented family of color in colonial history, because we can go back to the 1680s. But even so, there are enormous gaps because of racialized violence. Um, but they're also great things. So this is the ledger book from the store where we were reading what Benjamin would buy at the local store. And he'd often buy do a dozen buttons and he loved chocolate, <laughs> just a lot of things. And then um, they did an archaeological dig at the site of his cabin. And uh, these are some pictures I took of buttons that were found and some of the dishes. These dishes are later than his lifetime, but that his dishware was that on the top. And it was a German um, Rhineware that would have been kind of fancy at the time that he had had imported. Um, okay. How many of you had ever heard of Benjamin Banneker? No. Thank you, good, yeah. Black people know about Benjamin Banneker, <laughs> hopefully. Although my cousin Gwen, who was in the opening movie, had not learned about him. And she had had a lot of grief that she had, was, hadn't was even learned about him and was related to him. So, um, but hopefully some, some communities are learning about him and, and hopefully everyone will soon. So he was born again in 1731. His father, Robert, who married that amazing mother who was arguing in court, was said to have escaped um, enslavement three times. And his final time, he was purchased by a Quaker who allowed him to work for his freedom. I think it was Richard Gist, who was one of the most prominent Quakers in the area and owned a lot of land because he co-signed on the land. So he was able to purchase 100 acres, which was a lot for anyone at that time. And he was wise enough to put it in his name and his son's name because he understood at that time, land ownership and, and adherence to Christianity were the basis of citizens' rights more than race. I mean, race took a while to be solidified into the horrific thing it became. Um, in those years, it was still land ownership and Christianity. So he put the land in Benjamin's name as well to try to preserve, preserve freedom for another generation. So Benjamin was this endlessly curious, brilliant, scientific and poetic mind. And he became friends with the Quakers in the area. He was able to go to school for a few years. And one of his friends was George Ellicott, who was uh, another great thinker, astronomer, 
And his cousin was the most prominent surveyor in the US at that time. And he hired Benjamin Banneker to help him survey Washington, DC. So Benjamin Banneker went to what would become DC and he did the math. He did the work of astronomy to figure out where the buildings would go and he was paid for his time. When he came back from that job, he knew that he was on the map and um, he wanted to publish an almanac. He had written them before, but no one could believe that a black man could do that. So it hadn't been published. He'd been sort of led along, but then nobody would actually publish it because there was all this skepticism and there was all of this faulty science or, or out there around inequality. Um, and so Benjamin Banneker came back from surveying DC and he did all the math for a next for a um, almanac for 1792. And um, then he finished it and he wrote it on horseback to a publisher to get it published. And then he wrote one more letter. And this is, I'm going to read one more short chapter from the very beginning. Letter to the Future, Ellicott's Mills, Maryland, 1791. Benjamin Banneker tipped back his chair and rubbed his eyes. It had been a four candle night. When his final candlestick guttered out, he set his quill in the ink pot. He stood up, but his feet had fallen asleep in the long hours of sitting. So he hobbled a bit on them, rocking from his toes to his heels. Benjamin stepped onto the porch and looked out over his land. The world was awakening, coming on in bird song and rooster calls and sunlight burning off the mist over the orchard. He had spent many nights lying in those fields, looking up through a telescope, jotting down notes. He had tracked the stars and planets as they passed the meridian and had made the equations necessary to predict the precise times of an eclipse, as well as equinoxes and solstices, sunrises and sunsets. He had drawn out the phases of of the moon and had projected all the major astronomical events for the coming year. His almanac for 1792 was finally complete. Benjamin took a quick walk around the orchard, clearing his mind. He twisted the stiffness out of his back and stretched his arms up toward the sun. He knew that being in relationship with the sun and the stars had always been a matter of survival. His people in Africa had followed the stars in their sky maps, and now he had the mathematical skills to track celestial events on paper in an almanac that would be of practical use. The almanac would help farmers plan the best time to plant their crops and fishermen to safely cast out into the tides. Benjamin checked his beehives and plucked some chives from the garden. Then he walked to the chicken coop and pulled two warm eggs from a nest. He stood at his kitchen hearth, stirring the eggs and chives into a skillet, preparing his breakfast while preparing his thoughts. He knew what he had to do next. Benjamin cleaned the nib of his quill and smoothed out a fresh piece of paper. As he addressed the letter to Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of State, he felt his hand tremble and clench a bit. bit. His practiced, elegant penmanship was boring down on the page. He began cordially acknowledging the fact that Jefferson had probably never before received a letter from a black man. Sir, I'm fully sensible of the greatness of that freedom which I take with you on the present occasion, a liberty which seemed to me scarcely allowable when I reflected on that distinguished and dignified station in which you stand and the almost general prejudice and prepossession which is so prevalent in the world against those of my complexion. Benjamin then reminded Jefferson that he was a free man, endowed with the same liberties as Jefferson himself. Then he contrasted his own situation with that of most African Americans who were still enslaved. By the third page of the letter, Benjamin was directly addressing the founder's hypocrisy. He reminded Jefferson of the revolution and began quoting his most famous written work, the Declaration of Independence. I wanted to give the ancestors space for their inner life, uh, but a lot of them were also well-founded. That's part of the oral history. He told his family that he was surprised by the letter, that sometimes he looked at it and he felt startled that he had written this thing. 
but he also felt very proud. And it is a letter that is so brilliant that it feels like it came with that, that sort of ancestral or collective wisdom as part of it. Um, so Jefferson did respond right away. And this is his response. We have copies of both Banneker's letter and Jefferson's in Jefferson's notes, which he, co he copied everything that was sent to him. Um, and he basically said, no one wishes more than I to see examples of genius, which you furnish. Um, an interesting note now that we know he had children with Sally Hemmings at that point. So maybe there is a sincerity in that wish that we wouldn't have heard earlier that this example of black genius, maybe it hit differently as we would say now, right? That there's, um, cause he had sons in this, in this way, but um, he sent the almanac along with the letter to Condorcet who was the head of the French Academy of Sciences. So the highest scientific place in the, the, the world at the time, but it arrived the same week that Condorcet had been kidnapped as part of the French revolution and was in hiding. And so it was never given the publicity that it would have had. Um, but Jefferson did send it off and he did respond. And then Benjamin continued to write almanacs. He wrote almanacs for the next, um, well, he wrote them for many years, but they were published until every year until um, 1797. And in the next almanac, this was in the foreword. Jefferson's response. So it was called the most talked about document of the year because Jefferson's opponents just loved it, that it was this, here he's writing this letter to a black man acknowledging this man's genius and yet he's an enslaver. So it was a real rallying cry for abolitionists and there was high abolitionist sentiment after the, the revolution because people were calling out the hypocrisy of using the language of freedom to continue to enslave people. So this is just a reproduction of the room where Benjamin wrote his almanac and slept. This is a cabin, it was very, they worked with historians, it's very carefully reproduced and it looks like it would have looked then. And then uh, another and couple the moments. moments. The moments of standing there, mm -hmm. saying to ourselves, we are standing on the ground where his cabin was and where he lived was, um, well, people always say, well, how do you feel? And I always say, I'm speechless. I'm just so in awe of the fact that this was uh, a person in my ancestry that I did not even know about, and now I do. So, and th there are more of these little films that, um, but, but I think that's good. Thank you for listening. I would love to take questions and have a conversation about this. Um, yes. yes. Well, when I read the, the library newsletter, I'm a retired music teacher and it sounds weird, but I heard, I saw the name Benjamin Banneker and it was sort of delightful and sound to me that this must be something good. And when, when you talk about unknown history, History that's not heard. I've been so angry the last couple of years in terms of historical perspective. Number one, I was never even remotely taught about the Tulsa yeah. massacre. And that's what I grew up in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And you know, and then the thing recently that has angered me so deeply is in, in Florida, they've got some textbook that says the slaves learned the slaves learned valuable yeah. skills to help them later. What's, what? I, I don't understand why we can't you know all kinds of history it doesn't make us mm -hmm. uncomfortable so much as that we our heart breaks for these people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> it's really important that we learn it. We can't have clarity in the present for one thing unless we really face this. And you see, there's a terror around facing the truth of it right now and a horrible backlash against that because i do think there's a movement to learn and to share the well, truth how can we reverse this ridiculous mm -hmm. mm -hmm. how do we, I mean, keep sharing these stories i think right as much as yeah mm -hmm. thank you i imagine one of your early 
uh, slides and pages. Uh, the mother was writing before a court, I imagine, for the freedom of her children. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, accurately think that she was not successful? She was. She was. I should have said that. She was. So it's an extraordinary story. And one of the um, benefits and also the puzzles of telling this story of the Banneker family is that they were so much luckier than most people, right? And yet I wanted to also be talking, just like Banneker was writing letters on behalf of his brethren, he was not forgetting the people who were still enslaved. So I wanted to be telling the history of these horrific laws, but also giving a story that wasn't just about suffering. A lot of times it was about these extraordinary triumphs. So she petitioned the provincial court of Maryland, which was the highest court of Maryland, that her children be freed at 16 for the girls and 21 for the boy, Zachariah. And she actually won the case. And that's a very different thing than getting out when you're 31, which is the bulk of your life. It's your whole reproductive life. And so she, she was able to win. And one thing that was really interesting around the DNA research side of this Edie, for years, had always wondered, because we also connected to a person named Zachariah Lett, there were all these other cousins that were in like another column connected to him, and we didn't know, and the court document named him as her, like one of her kids from her first union, so he was a half-brother. So there were moments of of just incredible um, convergence of the oral histories, the new science and the written history. Yeah, but that was a good moment. She did win her case, apparently. Mm -hmm. He lived till uh, 75. Before the, that yeah. was pretty, uh, I know. at that time, 75 yeah. years old. That's right. pretty, I noticed that yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, what was, what, what was the life expectancy around that time? Well, a lot of times you read it was like 48. I mean, it was really, but so many people were worked so hard that they probably, the numbers, you know, there was an idea of laborers being expendable in a lot of ways. So those numbers might have skewed really early for that. But yeah, the family had longevity. His mother, Mary, was known as an herbalist. She was a healer in the area. And his sister, Minta, was the midwife. And Molly may have been an herbalist too. And so, and they had this land, they were making everything, including medicines probably from the land. So they were, um, he was healthy and his sisters really looked out for him. He never married and had children, but his sisters lived on the land with him and cooked for him. And, you know, he continued to farm, but they sort of supported him to also do his intellectual work. Um, but yeah, he lived a good, and he didn't publish his almanacs. He didn't re receive renown for his intellect until he was in his 60s, which is another good lesson to all of us. He just, right? I found it really encouraging and incredibly inspiring as I was writing this book because he continued so earnestly to write and to learn. And it wasn't until he was in his 60s that he got that recognition. So. How did your daughter take to this, to the trip and the research? Oh, she loved it. I mean, it was interesting. They got tired. You know, it, I was like looking at microfish and they were I, they're trying to entertain nine-year-olds, but they, they really liked it. And she has come to almost every reading. She's a photographer. So any photos you see of me, she's taken. And the really amazing thing is my niece, Hope it's okay to, okay to say this, but she is very seriously dyslexic and had a really hard time in school in a lot of ways. And now she wants to be a history professor. <laughs> she reads all the time. She will be texting me, like looking to see what libraries the book is in. She makes PowerPoints. So they, something woke up on this trip about history. You can tell history 
history differently. You can sure. look for the stories that are hidden. And I mean, we were looking in file cabinets and finding the ancestors' names. And I was like, girls, they were real, you know? So um, even though I remember my daughter acting very tired that day, it all was worth it. It was worth it. <laughs> yeah. Does uh, W.E.B. Du Bois have mm -hmm. any connection to that? Him? That's a really good yeah. question. Um, certainly part of the same lineage. And I think there, there were Banneker societies, which were young, educated Black men, and they were literary and scientific societies that went up to Du Bois' time. So he would have, I mean... I think he was a more known figure in those generations too. Mm -hmm. But the Frederick Douglass piece is a really interesting piece because Banneker's first biography was compiled by a Quaker woman named Martha Tyson, who was the daughter of George, his best friend, George Ellicott. And she decided to write this biography and she worked with her cousin to collect oral history. So it was like, and her cousin was named Rachel. It was so funny. You know, there are all these echoes. And so they collected oral histories about the family, who people who had known the Bannikers. She died before it could be published. Then her daughter worked on it and started corresponding with Frederick Douglass. So Frederick Douglass wanted this biography. He wanted um, Banneker to be out there as a figure for his people of inspiration. Um, the next daughter ended up dying before the book could be distributed. So again, it was not, Frederick Douglass did distribute it to his community, but it like never got as big as it maybe could have. But yeah, I think they, they had him as a lodestar, you know, maybe more than we have known him now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, you, you and then you, yeah. Is that how he became acknowledged through Douglas's work? Um, so he sort of got discovered or acknowledged. He was Douglas. acknowledged. Yeah, thank you. He in the um, Maryland Historical Society, there was a guy named John Latrobe who was who read Martha Tyson's biography aloud. Never credited her because she was a woman. So that's also interesting. She was never credited for the work she did. He would say a nice lady who's too modest to put her name on her work. <laughs> we were really modest so recently, right? Um, so, but anyway, that's my own side note there. He read his biography in front of the Maryland Historical Society. And so there were records of it there. Um, and then there would have been the Banneker societies and those like th those groups of black intellectuals holding the story. So it grew out of that diary and that research mm -hmm. and those societies then became formed. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, because she was a Quaker woman, um, you know, and they came up against their own stuff of like, do I have enough credibility to write this and to gather this? Thank goodness she did while people were alive who knew the Banneker family. So, yeah. Thank you. I love that you, that you had the, the drawing, the slide where the, the first generation was married, um, mm -hmm. an English woman to the African yeah. man, because that tells us where the name came from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different uh, theories on the name, but it means, I guess it is. It, it is a Wolof name that means like sweetness. It can be like a mother's name for a son if he has a sweet temperament, you know? And so, and he was always said, the grandfather was always said to have a really sweet contemplative temperament. So. And, and can you, could you go back into the African genealogy? I don't know. He was said to be a prince. I don't know if that's a legend. You know what I mean? There's that you wonder. Um, but that's a good question. I had things like that where I thought, oh, if I wanted to spend five more years, that's what I would do. I would go to Senegal and I would also do more looking into John Newman's papers because now we know he was the guy who indentured Molly. And so Banaka would have been a worker there with Molly, I think. That's how they would have met. Um, and so maybe there's, but of course, people of color were not reported 
properly or fully and names were changed. So it's hard to find things. Mm -hmm. And I decided I wanted to publish it rather than wait too many, you know, <laughs> it was tricky though, because it's, you get so into the research, it's interesting. Someone else will pick up. Right. Uh, there's more work to be done. I mean, there's a lot that's been done, but there's, I feel like we could use even more. Mm -hmm. So the brother, Zach Ryan died, he said? No, he ended up having a whole family okay. that we know about, and we can trace a lot of us from his family okay. too. Because you're, you're from a female we're from Jemima, okay. it, which is the, the, the sister. Yes, they often named children after parents, which anyone here who does genealogy, that can get very confusing. And families of color really did this, I think, because legally everything was working to strip them of their family ties. They legally were not allowed to stay with their family. And so they would name first names after siblings as a way of denoting family. So like Edie is the really thorough genealogist and she's had quite a tricky time because you have Aquila and then Aquila Jr. You have Jemima and you know, you have to keep them track, keep track of them, but she does. Um, yeah. Um, well, first I want to thank you for introducing me to this man, Benjamin Mann, who I never heard about before. Well, that was an amazing journey reading the book and oh, learning great. about thank this man's you. contribution to this country. Mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing. But I, I was thinking about you, you know, how rich that journal was and stuff. I can only imagine what the other four journals must have been. I mean, it's like what the world missed out on must have been extraordinary, really. And um, any, when I was reading the book, he reminded me a little bit about when he was the way he looked at the world, like Thoreau, mm -hmm, a little bit. Mm -hmm. The way he sort of looked at the world, it was like, yeah, I, I kind of see that in in him. But um, but thank yeah, you. just thank, just thank you. you for the the, uh, the amazing research you did. Thank you for reading and being here. Yeah, and I like that connection to Thoreau. I mean, he did. They were really isolated on this land, but the nature is so intelligent and you can see from his journal that he was observing nature really closely but he was always coming up with meaning to and and a philosophy around it so just this deep thoughtfulness is there and i think because his mother was an herbalist too that probably went into it mm -hmm. I'm wondering, did, did you have to do any statistics uh, i haven't read the book yet mm -hmm. uh, to start it but in terms of the number of the black uh, population versus white, and how yes. normal it might have been for for you know descendants to be of mixed color, because I found in my own family that's definitely the case. So I'm in a very similar oh good, suit. Uh, good. My, my relative is a uh, uh, goes back to Lemuel Haynes. Oh yes, I came across that yeah. name. Mm -hmm. He was the first uh, mm -hmm. major black. Uh, Congregationalist minister in yeah. Vermont. Wow. And it happened to be that my relative that was uh, lost her, the Lemuel son that was her husband, and he died at sea, so she remarried a white wow. person. And so yeah. nobody in our family has known about this. And so mm -hmm. we have gone uh, through some genealogical records. So I just wondered. That's a really fascinating. It's, it's not. not it is not nearly as unusual as we would have been taught, right? And I found that, and my cousin Edwin says at some point in the book, this is not surprising to Black people. It's surprising to white people. Yeah, exactly. There's, a, there's, I mean, 30% of the DNA test for the average um, African-American man in this country is 30% European DNA. So there's that. That's the most often that mixing coming from a white master. And it's very painful to look at that. But even other stories like these are pretty prevalent. And in the early Chesapeake where this was happening, it was much more common. So like very early Virginia, there were a couple counties that were 30% free people of color. And then our family in Maryland were free people of color. This is early, early around the revolutionary time. And then they came into Ohio. And that was something I never learned about, right? I never learned about free people of color. 
that we learned one monolithic tragedy of enslavement rather than this variety. And even within enslavement, like a lot of people in these early years or small towns would live in the town and they'd be skilled tradespeople. I'm not saying what that that line from yeah and yay it worked out for them I'm not saying that at all but there are there is a huge range and variety um and there were just many more free people of color so they lived in a community called Mount Gilboa that was all free people of color that a Quaker woman had willed the land for them so yes this is exactly relevant but I was interested when you said, which I hadn't thought of, that over time, the perception and definition of race and interaction mm -hmm. changed. It was more mm -hmm. fluid than I thought. And I grew up in a little town in northern Illinois, and my mother told me a generation just before mine, uh, a young couple got married, and she got pregnant, and their child was noticeably black. Mm -hmm. And people were just, mm -hmm. it's a little town and very conservative, and People were just disgusted and horrified and everything. And they tried to stay there where they both grown up their whole lives, but they had to move away mm -hmm. because of that. And I, I thought that that town, I think, is still the same way. Yeah. And they, they're they good, quote unquote, Christian people. <laughs> it's not working out that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> Remind me not to stop the <laughs> yeah. I, I had very, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I grew up and I, my family only used the N word. I didn't mm. know anything else. I was the first person to go to college. I came into Northwestern and my first, one of my first classes was a sociology class. And I was just blown away because it, it showed me things again that I was never yeah. taught. And, and it was hard for me to go back home yeah. after that. Because I knew their hearts were good, but the context that they lived in was so cruel. Mm -hmm. And it just, but anyway, the, the idea of the, the, the race definitions change from where you are to all kinds of things. It's fluid, it's not mm -hmm. static. Mm -hmm. It was interesting that it was so liberal. That yeah, meant. I know. That's nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was curious, he says, but there was an herbalist. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or herbalist, <laughs> either way, right? Um, and uh, I was curious about who influenced his science. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would imagine that that would be part of it, right? I think so. Uh, I think she that... would have and his father. Uh -huh. Because some of the things he knew, African people knew. Correct, yeah. So the Dogon people knew this about the Star of Sirius. In Northern Africa, I mean, they had advanced cosmologies and astronomy. So uh, there's a, um, there is an ethno-mathematician named Ron E. Glass who studies Benjamin Banneker and has traced how much African knowledge is in his astronomy. Mm -hmm. So I think that it was passed down I think they had that awareness of the stars and the cosmos and then had the awareness of nature, too. Also, his father, they were known as extremely successful farmers. And a lot of townspeople talked about it, that they had better crops because they used irrigation techniques. So Robert, his father, was probably bringing a lot of African knowledge into farming and astronomy and um was teaching his son mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did your work at all intersect when you got to that point where they were in the ohio territory yeah um that seems to be the timing when the native american people would be start to be driven out mm -hmm. and yeah. i didn't know if you, you know there were references to laws where mm -hmm. white women weren't supposed to mm -hmm. marry black or native people mm -hmm. Did any of that come up? Or, you know, just... A little, but I started to limit myself because I had so much to do. And I had been very interested in Native American history for a long time. And so I was sort of magnetized to that. But I thought, actually, it's enough to, to stay with this story. Um, but it, it is interesting to me. And there's a whole kind of confluence with Bacon's rebellion that happens 
they start creating, the landowners started creating the whiteness laws in response to Native American uprising and working class uprising. So there are little bits of it, um, but I couldn't go there. I just didn't have as much time. But, you know, early accounts of Molly living like on this farm in the wilderness would say things like she knew no, you know, they knew no neighbors. They didn't know anyone. And I think, mm, really? Because they were probably friends with the Susquehannock people. Exactly. Uh, you know, so there's this sort of blind spot around um, what ended up happening with these mixed communities because the, the the community in Ohio too was a multiracial mixed race community they usually got along with the indigenous Native American people and there was even marriage there because they were all kind of outsiders from the, the mainstream and they had to look out for each other but a lot of really self-actualized African American communities which again I didn't know that much about yeah, so a lot of it was me educating myself what I wished I had been taught. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> aren't we all, right? <laughs> well, you're a wonderful audience. Thank you so much for listening and being here. Thank you.